So good morning. I'm Beatrice, and today I'll be presenting our capstone project, which is a wearable nanostructured toxic gas sensor on which I've been working along with my partners, Josh, Rebecca, and Michael, supervised by Dr. Vivek Maishwari. I'll first give you a brief introduction to the problem that we've been solving, describe the solution we developed and its mechanism of action, before going into detail about the testing and results that were obtained, as well as the analyses and conclusion that we drew from those. So here's the problem. Between 2010 and 2015, there have been over 2,000 cases of lethal carbon monoxide poisoning in the US alone. It's no wonder that this gas has earned the nickname of silent killer, as it is colorless, odorless, and undetectable in any way without a specialized device. Devices such as those can be found in most households, but are unsuitable to industrial applications since they are heavy, have high detection limits, and it can take up to hours to notify you of the presence of a toxic gas in your house, by which time you have already developed symptoms. Toxic gas concentrations in one part of a room can be very different from the area where you breathe. This is why we developed a wearable toxic gas detector. Our goal was to have a device that could quickly detect 15 parts per million of carbon monoxide, which is a concentration below the onset of any adverse effects. We also wanted our device to function within the USB range, therefore be powered at less than five volts, and finally, to be accessible, therefore remain below market price for similar devices. How are we to accomplish this? Well, we designed a 3D nanostructure comprised of an array of palladium nanorods throughout which uh, zinc oxide coated oxidized multi walled carbon nanotubes were dispersed. This configuration would allow a high surface area of the nanotubes to be exposed to the ambient air. This is what will lead us to our target detection limit of 15 parts per million, since the sensing mechanism occurs through the nanotubes. Furthermore, the interface between the zinc oxide and the oxide groups on the nanotube would allow our device to function at room temperature as opposed to hundreds of degrees Celsius, as is the case for state-of-the-art zinc oxide-based sensors. We began our work with the fabrication of the nanorod forest. The palladium nanorods were electrochemically grown in an anodized aluminum template. We chose to use palladium because it is a very inert metal. It would not react with the carbon monoxide when tested and would not be dissolved by nitric acid and <coughs> potassium hydroxide, which were used to dissolve the aluminum template and the silver layer that had been sputtered onto it. The size of the nanorods was optimized so that they would be long enough and sufficiently spaced to allow an adequate dispersion of the nanotubes throughout the array without being so long that they would break and make electrical contact, effectively shorting our circuit. We decided on a size of an aspect ratio of 1 to 4 4 nanorods. And here on your right, you can see a top view of the palladium nanorod array after the dissolution of the aluminum template, which was taken with an SEM. And on your left are free palladium nanorods, which were taken from that array so that we could measure them. After this, we set out to work on the preparation of the nanotubes. We chose to buy pre oxidized nanotubes so we would not have to go through the complex and dangerous procedure of oxidizing them ourselves. We also chose to use double-walled carbon nanotubes to ensure their chemical and thermal stability throughout the procedures we would be subjecting them to without compromising their electrical properties. We then coated the nanotubes in zinc oxide using zinc acetate in the presence of lithium hydroxide. We optimized that procedure via the concentration and volume of reagents to ensure that a coating was formed which was optimal for the de detection of gases. We confirmed the presence of zinc oxide on the nanotubes by EDX and obtained an SEM image of the zinc oxide coated nanotubes after they had been spin coated onto an ITO substrate. At this point, we realized that due to time constraints, we would not be able to both develop a procedure for the dispersion of the tubes within the palladium array and perform sufficient testing on our device. We therefore decided to scale back to a simpler configuration for our proof of concept. This device was made by spin coated the coated nanotubes onto a glass substrate before annealing them and placing two copper electrodes on either sides of the tubes, forming an electrical circuit. 
We then soldered electrical wires onto the electrodes to minimize the effects of uh, movement of wires on noise and signal artifacts, as well as to improve the repeatability of our testing. Now testing was conducted using a gas test chamber into which we had drilled three holes, one for the influx of nitrogen, one for the influx of carbon monoxide, and finally an outlet hole to release the pressure within the chamber. The first test that was performed on each device was a cyclic voltammetry test to check for any charging effects on the device and to measure its resistance and linearity. After this, a transient DC test was performed at a constant voltage of one volt DC. This allowed us to measure a current going through the device as an indicator of the presence of toxic gases. <laughs> Initially, only nitrogen was flowed over the device in order to obtain a baseline. Once a stable baseline had been obtained, the nitrogen flow was shut off and carbon monoxide was introduced into the chamber. The carbon monoxide came from a tank into which it was already mixed with nitrogen at a concentration of 10,000 parts per million, or 1%. The carbon monoxide was flowed into the chamber at a speed of 80 milliliters per minute. We assumed, since nitrogen gas and carbon monoxide have similar molecular weights, that they would be well mixed and that the concentration of carbon monoxide would be even throughout the chamber. So we initially expected, based on literature that used zinc oxide and graphene oxide sensors, that the zinc oxide would coat the nanotubes as discrete particles at, at the uh, oxidation sites. Reducing gases, such as carbon monoxide, would then be able to react at those sites and donate electrons to the semiconductor. These donated electrons would increase the count of charge carriers present in the network, leading to an increase in its conductivity as it was exposed to reducing gases. As we began a testing, we made several observations which led us to optimize our testing setup. First, we realized that devices were responding to changes in pressure in the test chamber. We, had, we then had to ensure first that the gas coming into the chamber was not flowing directly onto the device and that our flow rates were low enough not to cause an increase in pressure in the chamber or we would get false positives on our device. We also saw some charging effects on some of the device which we saw during our cyclic voltammetry testing. To ensure that these were not seen in our final data, we ran a current for 30 minutes through each device before exposing it to any gas. We also saw a high level of variability from one device to the next. To try and remedy this issue, we standardized our fabrication protocols, including the concentration and volume of nanotubes placed on the glass, the spin coating procedure, the placement of the electrodes, and the soldering of the wires. Even so, we still saw big differences from the, in the network densities from one device to the other. We attributed these discrepancies to intrinsic variability in the spin coating and aggregation of the tubes, which we could not control. We also realized that zinc hydroxides were likely being formed on the surface of the nanotubes during our coating procedure. To remove these, we developed a annealing procedure, which would remove them according to the chemical formula you see here. After a few iterations, we, re we decided that annealing for one hour at 200 degrees Celsius was sufficient to remove enough of the hydroxides. The results we obtained actually showed the opposite of what we had hypothesized would happen. As you can see in this plot, which represents the current over time as our device was exposed to different gases, you can see large dips in the current, which correspond to the introduction of carbon monoxide in the chamber. These dips in current by 80%, uh, or by 80%, sorry. After this, once the carbon monoxide had been removed and the device purged with nitrogen, the current going through would recover uh, its original value of the current or even higher than that. So we saw a few times here that the, carbon, the presence of carbon monoxide was causing a reduction in the current, in the conductivity of our network. We also noticed this effect on a few subsequent tests with different devices. This also indicated that our sensor was reusable as it was able to recover from the effects of the carbon monoxide. Each time the device was purged, it was able to return to a higher and stable current. Bearing all this in mind, all our observations and results, 
we came to propose a new mechanism, bearing in mind that the carbon nanotubes did not behave the same way as the graphene we had seen in literature. We therefore hypothesized that the negative dipole on the oxygen atom of the carbon monoxide was pushing negative charges to the interface between the zinc oxide and the oxidized nanotubes. Being P-type semiconductors, the oxidized nanotubes had holes as their majority carriers. Therefore, when electrons were pushed into the bulk of the nanotubes, they were able to recombine with the holes and lower the count of charge carriers present in, this, in the network. This would have the effect of lowering the conductivity of our circuit whenever it was exposed to polar gases as opposed to reducing ones. We then performed a cost analysis on our sensor to ensure that it met our goal of being below market price. Incorporating the cost for all the elements that went into the device as it is now and approximations for the components that had yet to be incorporated into our device, including uh, battery, circuitry, and enclosure, and so on, we came to an approximate cost of, of slightly less than $40 per device. This is 20% of the cost for handheld carbon monoxide sensors, which are currently on the market. These devices are much larger and bulkier than ours and have much longer detection times. As this work continues, the next steps that must be addressed are, the, are to conduct more research into the sensing mechanism and to troubleshoot the testing setup to further improve its reproducibility. After this, the procedure for the dispersion of the multi-walled carbon nanotubes in the palladium array should be developed to further increase the sensitivity of our device. Uh, finally, the electronics and enclosure of the device should be designed and implemented. In conclusion, we were able to sense the presence of 10,000 parts per million of carbon monoxide within a few seconds of exposure through a decrease in the conductivity of the zinc oxide co coated oxidized multi-walled carbon nanotubes. The device is able to op operate at a low voltage of one volt while being able to be manufactured into a lightweight sensor which can be fabricated at 20% of the market price for similar devices. Further optimization is, however, necessary to improve the detection limit to our target of 15 parts per million. I would like to acknowledge a few people before bringing this presentation to an end. Chief among them are Dr. Vivek Maheshwari and Jen Coggan for their continuous support of the project and without whom none of this would have been possible. Thank you for your time and I'll now open up the floor to any questions.